Well, greetings and blessings. I am very grateful to be here with you today. I want to thank Kavala for inviting me to give the Dharma talk this month. It's provided me an opportunity to look deeply into the intricacies of what lies beneath my actual in the world daily practice of Junpo's brilliant Mondo Zen process. Much of this talk relays my personal experiences as to what led me to choosing to receive the gift of the essence of Atadipa, Mondo Zen, this ongoing practice of applying emotional koans in my daily life and always learning as to what arises that gets in the way and what helps the return to clear, deep, heart-mind. I want to offer a brief overview as to what brought me to this practice. Speak to my first taste of this practice, the practice itself, and to share an in-depth life-altering experience that happened back in 2006 that essentially led me to this practice in the first place in which I still feel to be very relevant now. I've been taking part in many Mondo Zen Shashins since my first one at Sonoma Mountain Zen Center back in 2009. As I recall, this was the last one that was connected to the Mankind Project and had only men in attendance. The Mankind Project, or MKP, is an organization that helps men to explore, expand awareness of, and to continue the healing work of the parts of the self that get in the way of living fulfilling, emotionally conscious lives. I had been involved with the Mankind Project for almost 10 years at that time and had recently heard about an upcoming Zen retreat that involved learning a process which included deconstructing and reconstructing the ego. Now that got my attention. <laughs> Upon arriving at Sonoma Mountain Zen Center and checking into our sleeping quarters, we gathered near the big bell just below the old barn, converted into the Zendo, perched among the redwoods on top of a knoll. We walked into the Zendo and took our seats. Junpo was there and other staff. Once settled onto our cushions, facing the central altar in two concentric circles, we were guided through an orientation, an evening meditation, a brief closing process, and instructions to get a good night's sleep that wake up would be at 4.30 the next morning. I awoke early to sound to the sound of owls hooting and the oaks and redwoods. Still dark in the pre-dawn light, we made our way up to the zendo as the bancho was being rung. The dimly lit candle room provided just enough light for us to find our places. The bancho completed, followed by the densho. Junpo's assistant, his inji, entered, passing the lighted incense stick to Junpo, and then quickly took his seat. Junpo slowly walked around the room, bowed, offered the incense to the central altar, did formal bounds, and took his seat. There was complete momentary silence. Then he spoke. Atadipa, you are this light, pure selfless awareness. Rely upon selfless awareness. Do not rely upon concepts of self and other that appear. Do not depend upon beliefs, sensations, and emotions which arise and fall away. Meditative awareness, clear intention, acting wisely, compassionately, and skillfully are this practice. Rely upon this only. Rely upon this ceaselessly. Then all together we voiced Datsadipa. Junpo had us read it again, twice more, for good measure. Something deeply, something deeply resonated with these words of the Buddha. Especially you, I, we are this light. 
pure selfless awareness. I knew this to be true deep within. This is truth. The rest of the morning service kept reinforcing this line. You are this light and that pure awareness pervades the whole universe, revealing this self right here, right now. Within this service, let us realize and unite with this infinitely compassionate universal life. Look, look, pure awareness, pure awareness, yes. In any moment and in any place, none, be, none can be other than the marvelous interplay of this glorious light. Indeed, it was during this morning service that it connected with why I was here. So what about the ego deconstruction reconstruction? I did not have very long to wait. Over the next couple of days, we were introduced to the Mondo Zen process itself. Jude Po laid down some context. We took turns reading aloud from the Mondo Zen manual and Jun Po did a large group demo with three volunteers. It was the next day when beginning the work in our small practice groups that once again, something deep within me reawakened. I was fortunate to have Doshin as my priest facilitator for Mondo who guided me through the Mondo Zen process part one. Mondo Zen Ego Deconstruction Reconstruction Koans, a Zen transmission. As Doshin began facilitating me through the koans, with each one, I dropped deeper and deeper with a steadily expanding sense of returning home. Is it possible to purely listen without an opinion? Yes. Where is this deeper listen located within the body? Here, here. Who are you? Who am I? Who are we within this deep heartfelt listening? I don't know. Not knowing. What do you like? What are we like at this depth of consciousness? Empty, timeless, eternal, vast, how vast? <laughs> Infinite, star systems, nebulous galaxies are born, disappear here. Is there fear here? No, no fear, silent, empty, still. Everything arises here. As I looked deeply into Doshin's eyes, the memory of my second wife, Suzanne's passing flooded home once again. The direct transmission of here brought it on. Doshin asked me to describe what had happened on that night, the night of May 28th, and into the morning of May 29th, 2006. It was late in the 11th day, of Suzanne being in the California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. She just had her third brain surgery following a hemorrhage in the brain 11 days earlier. They finally completed some brain wave tests. It did not look good at all. They finally wheeled the equipment out of the ICU and the nurses allowed for Suzanne and me to have a little alone time. About one month earlier, she and I had made a pact that whoever crossed over first when that time came would fully commit to showing the other what it was like to whatever extent possible. Suzanne and I had also promised to one another on numerous occasions that neither of us wanted to be kept alive on life support if we clearly were not going to be coming back. My sense was that the time might be approaching. I was moved to check in with her, the breathing tube that had kept her from being able to speak from the beginning of the week after her first brain surgery was still in place. Back then, she'd been fully awake, eyes open, 
gesturing, optimistic, with a thumbs up. Now her eyes were closed. She was very quiet and very calm. What was spoken from the deepest part of my being were three things. That if this was her time to cross over, even though my human self wanted her to stay, a greater part knew this was her journey, her path, to trust the wisdom of the higher order of intelligence to guide. I would honor that and work to let her go to presence, allowing and accepting. On the other hand, if this was more, if this was more for her to learn, to experience by remaining here on earth, I'd completely be here for her, for her ongoing healing, as I knew her wonderful son and daughter and dear friends would be as well. The third thing which she already knew was that my love for her was, is and always will be boundless, unconditional. I was complete with what I felt guided to say. At this moment, a force arose behind me and a command came into my mind. Go lie down, go lie down now. I kissed Suzanne on the cheek and walked to the ICU waiting room, a short ways away from where she was. I noticed the clock in the wall, close to midnight. I lay down on the couch and as I pulled up the blankets, I became enveloped by a large greatness. The sense of levitating up and out of the hospital, then rising above San Francisco, above California and departing planet Earth was immediate. An expanding force field that encompassed and knew every detail of my conscious mind and was rapidly reaching into the depths of my subconscious, clearly knew exactly what it was doing. As this was happening, the self-referencing me, the I, that was normally present, took a back seat. Instructions to keep letting go and to not knowing mind prevailed. What emerged was a vastly expanded realm of being guided through interdimensional space. From here, there was still an awareness of my normal small human brain, which was very, very far away yet accessible at any moment. Predominantly was the awareness of being held and shown and guided by a, presence of, by a presence of expanding, encompassing, revealing vast domains of intelligence. While appearing unfamiliar at first, this recognition of the surrounding presence began to reveal itself. Suddenly, the thought surged forward with the, and the me returned. Oh my God, Suzanne is crossing over. It's happening right now. This expanding presence, I recognize it. It is her essential essence. For a few moments, this arising of immense sadness and grief revealed a tether back to my earth body. It was back on the couch, looking up at the clock. It was around two in the morning. This was only momentary. Again, my earth self was gone, far, far away. This increasingly vast presence was back, holding, guiding, instructing, while continuing to grow into an increasingly expanding field of infinite, unconditionally compassionate, all accepting love. I was transported to an immense realm that in some way appeared to be a giant room of awareness. I got the impression that what was being presented to me was being translated into a form that was continually being adjusted to optimize my perception and learning. Somehow it was transmitted to me via a kind of telepathy to the deepest core of my being that everything that has ever been experienced, ever felt, known, manifested, thought from the origin of existence and from nothing was all here now, held by an infinite field of intelligence. Simultaneously to this, it was real, revealed to me that all that is happening now throughout the entire universe is all feeding into these ever-expanding layers of knowing. 
Lastly, including all of this, I was present, presented with a view into the field of pure potentiality for all that ever will be. Interwoven into this matrix were the streams of karma. In some way, my capacity to comprehend all of this was being boosted thousands of times beyond anything I had ever known this lifetime. When I completed speaking about this part of my experience to Doshin, his response was, the storehouse. You were in the storehouse. From here, my journey continued through more realms that could only be absorbed beyond my cognitive ability to describe them. Finally, I, or meaning we, this guiding Suzanne essence presence and I, arrived at a location that shimmered with what I can best describe as how the Northern Lights appear. I was held here for a while, long enough to get glimpses of what I sensed as supreme gatekeepers, beings of even more vast, infinite light. In a, f in a few final moments, the force field that had coaxed me brief briefly to my makeshift couch bed, which seemed so long ago, and had then transported me on this odyssey, unfurled itself from around me and morphed itself through these pulsing translucent curtains. To what I knew somehow was Suzanne's essence returning to a greater state, state that had compassionately lent a part of itself to take form into her earth body and had now found its way home to vast, powerful, silent, infinite light. Within an instant, I was back on the couch in the ICU waiting room. I looked up at the clock. It was just about four in the morning. I lay there for a couple of hours, absorbing all of this. I then got up that early morning and walked back to Suzanne's room in intensive care. There she was, lying peacefully, her body on life support, her eyes open, empty, infinite her body lying here, her essence self merged with the great beyond. Just then her brain surgeon showed up with a group of advanced med students. He spoke softly about Suzanne's case, still with a tone of optimism for her recovery. I approached him and requested a brief private talk. He beckoned me to a quiet side room. We sat across from one another and I spoke with more clarity than it had ever known since birth. I thanked him for his noble efforts to save her, for doing everything that he could do. I then said to him that her time here on earth was complete, that she had learned what she had come here to learn, and that she'd crossed over last night. Her surgeon continued to look deeply into my eyes for a long moment, and then he thanked me. The mutual understanding was complete. The journey of integrating this experience continues to unfold. It was very helpful to relay this to Doshin in the middle of my introduction to Mondo Zen. This ego was indeed being deconstructed, recalibrated, and reconstructed with, with continuing throughout the retreat back in 2009 and has continued through all the retreats that I have been blessed to participate in and continues onward. So this experience that I shared with Doshin and now with all of you, coupled with this ongoing Mondo Zen practice, was and continues to be highlighted by Atta Deepa. You are this light, pure, selfless awareness. So Suzanne delivered on her promise, including me in the process of her crossing over. This recalibrated everything which elevated my interest in deconstructing and reconstructing this ego, which led me to this practice. And with eternal gratitude to Junpo and Doshin and others who have guided me, engaged me and restored me in this process of Mondo Zen, practicing over and over again to stop and drop into clear, deep, fast, infinite heart mind is indeed my daily practice. In preparing for this Dharma talk, 
I have been reflecting on my 10 year long practice of Mondo and everyday life. I know from doing shadow work, somatic experiencing work, hypnosis, and many other form forms of therapy, as well as many mixed gender Mondo Zen retreats and Zen silent retreats, that it takes a while to change basic patterns of behavior that have become layered down in the brain over the course of this lifetime. Recently, reading and listening to Dan Siegel and other brain scholars has helped me to clarify how patterns of reaction get set in the brain and what takes place in the process of changing these modes of behavior. Life experience is registered in the brain by electrical firing down the length of the axions or nerve fibers. With the release of neurotransmitters, experiences get neurons to fire. When neurons fire, they wire together. As they wire together increasingly, patterns of behavior get more and more established. This, combined with ancient genetically infused patterns of reacting to stimuli, including the fight, flight, or freeze response in the most primitive part of the brain, greatly influence our habitual emotional reactions to circumstances. As it is said in Atadipa, do not depend on beliefs, sensations, and emotions, which arise and fall away. Meditative awareness, clear intention, acting wisely, compassionately, skillfully, are this practice. So in this practice of Mondo, we work to develop new skills, including the skill of responding compassionately to situations that previously we habitually reacted to. In developing a skill such as in practicing an emotional koan in Mondo, the skill of compassionate, conscious responding to a given recurring challenging life situation. This training of the brain involves myelin, the white matter in the brain. Dan Siegel points out that as you train the brain consistently over time, the relevant circuits receive more and more myelin, which greatly increases the circuit's speed while substantially decreasing the resting and recovery time needed for a given circuit. If you are a circuit laying down myelin, you are effective many, many more times than a non-myelin-enabled circuit. How you rewire these parts of the brain together determines overall how its activity will be. So this practice of meditative awareness, clear intention, acting wisely, compassionately and skillfully can literally change the physical properties of the brain. In my experience, it takes time, dedicated, dedication and practice to gradually grow these areas of the brain and nervous system in new, more conscious, choice-based ways of being. One of the greatest things I have ever learned and witnessed over and over again is that such a crucial and foundational part of this wise and skillful practice is choosing compassion and kindness for all the aspects of the self, this ego. No matter how young or how stuck or how stubborn these old patterns are, choosing compassionate presence makes room for insight and for change. Even after the fact of having indeed reacted habitually to something or someone, by pausing and viewing the situation later from the space of compassionate witnessing makes room for optimal learning. One more thing I will add that has profoundly helped with the effectiveness of this practice is a willingness to be in not knowing curious mind. As has been said many times, in not knowing there are infinite possibilities. And curiosity is like fertilizer in the field of pure potentiality. As is stated in Master Tori's Awaken One's Vow, before we react, we will consider deeply our personal and collective karma that brought these conditions and circumstances upon ourselves. Then, with each moment's arising flash, of our normal feelings and thoughts, 
we will simultaneously recognize within us a field of pure awareness, wisdom, compassion, and skillful means. Who knows what our potential and collective karma is? Just to consider this, to be curious, without the pressing need to know, creates the space for recognizing this field of pure awareness, compassion, and skillful means. I remember well from my first Mondo Zen retreat back in 2009, Shun Po's words in the Mondo Manual. In the end, as in the beginning, it's all about love, unconditional love. Thank you.